Also from the Crypto Econ Lab, we have Tom Mellon, who comes to Crypto Econ Lab from a background in theoretical physics and computational chemistry. He spent the last couple of years modeling infectious disease, and now he will be talking to us about fair prices for perpetual storage. Yeah. Take it away, Tom. Cheers. Thanks very much, Carola. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about a fair price for perpetual utility. So what does this mean? Ah. So I'm just going to change my screen because we seem to be sharing the presenter view. <laughs> no problem. Give me one second. Okay, there we are, no problem. Okay, so a fair price for perpetual utility. What does this mean? Okay, so utility, first of all, from the user perspective, this is the expectation of access to a service now or at some time in the future. From the perspective of the storage provider or what you might think of as a miner and other networks, uh, utility, uh, block rewards essentially are one in proportion to the, the utility provided. Um, so utility, um, what we're thinking about here uh, on, on the on the Filecoin L1, it's, it's data storage, which gives a decentralized and robust uh, and efficient foundation for humanity's information. But elsewhere, it could be other things. So it could be off-chain com uh, compute, it could be networking, it could be uh, attention. Um, but focus here is on data storage. Okay, so perpetual, what do I mean by this? So perpetual is a pretty high target. Um, I mean, keep things in context. I mean, I think it was like in the 50s that w uh, when, when Shockley got the Nobel Prize for the transistor, uh, you know, progress has been uh, absolutely massive. So who, who knows where we'll be in 50 years? But as an absolutely serious target, uh, we do need reliable long-term storage. I mean, you can, you can see the kind of motivation from this in terms of the so uh, societal value. I mean, if you want to store important information, election results, humanitarian data, environmental records. Uh, you, you need to do this in a, uh, a long-term way. And this this kind of relies on securing a chain of evidence, relies on immutability, and it, it relies to be able to store on a scale of decades to uh, ide ideally hundreds of years. Okay, so price. Price, we're going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to skip over this slide for now, but there are different things to think about there. I think um, an interesting aspect of this is what, what we think of as the fair price. So, okay, sure, you can just say the fair price. This is kind of the market equilibrium between supply and demand. But um, I think, you know, we, we can do a bit better than that. I mean, in, in order to come up with a fair price, you have to be able to give some assessment of what the underlying factors are that determine the price and what this is likely to be in the future. And that's not simple at all. So in order to, to come up with a fair price, I think we have to be informed and we have to have sufficient models and information to do this. So there's fairness in this aspect, but there's also kind of a wider point as well. So fairness generally has not been the domain, domain um, of economics, as pointed out here by Kahneman and Thaler. But I think to make a kind of wider point, we have an opportunity to do something something different here. Um, in general, Web 2 economies have been based on this kind of principle of information asymmetry. You don't really know how your information is being used. Um, take, for example, AWS for one example. I mean, it's easy to get your data in there, very low cost, but getting your data out, kind of different story. Uh, and, and this this same story is seen across Web2, but I think with Web3, we have a, a chance to do something completely different. Everything is, is, it, is, is written in code in a transparent way, and the incentives are, are laid down in a completely transparent way that's much more equitable to the different parties involved. So I think there is really an opportunity to, to have a much fairer take on on long-term storage uh, and other things in web3 generally okay so that's kind of the background um some of the things that we can think about whenever we try to examine long-term storage are sure there's the mission this is what's motivating motivating us we want to have uh long-term storage for humanity's most important data and to an extent the principles but with which we uh will develop this is, is motivated by fairness um, and and encoded in the crypto economic incentives in the carrot and in the stick in the in the collateral and how this is slashed um, and the block rewards that are earned um, but some other aspects that we have to kind of drill down into if we want to price something like perpetual storage fundamentally you're relying on people having hardware having disks 
uh, buying bandwidth, um, having uh, physical facilities. So that is something we, we have to consider if we're going to think about price, as well as other things like redundancy and how we might, might uh, use some DeFi ideas or funding ideas to, to structure how um, the long-term storage is paid for. Okay, so first of all, the basics of the crypto economic incentives. Um, storage providers and block rewards uh, in order for uh, in order from st uh, storing information but if they don't store it reliably their collateral can be slashed so you can see here that if we examine the chain uh, you can see how how effective these incentives are so okay sure anybody can have a fault even good miners uh, a hard disk can fail or electricity can can be cut uh, but you, you can see here the 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 incentives are effective uh, because, for example, for this minor sector that's shown, I don't know if you can see it well, but for this minor sector that's shown, okay, there's a fault, but then that fault is recovered the next day. Uh, and then, okay, there's another fault, but it's, it's recovered again. So the, the incentives are incredibly effective. They're virtually always uh, fixed, but there's also sufficient slackness in the system that good miners, if something breaks, they don't get uh, penalized uh, straight away. So this is kind of basics of crypto economic incentives and determining these parameters and how big the faults uh, fee should be and what the delays are. This is something we try to uh, determine through simulation. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that today. I just wanted to set out the basics of the incentives. Okay, so how do these incentives actually um, affect the price? So one aspect of this is hardware costs. And this is kind of an interesting little problem that came up whenever I was in Las Vegas last week talking to some of the storage miners. And um, one of the things they were telling me about is, okay, we've got these hard drives and these hard drives fail sometimes. And they have a warranty and the warranty is three years. Um, and they, so there's different kind of options they can take. They can have a strategy where, okay, they replace it within warranty or they just uh, wait as long as possible and let the disk fail. Um, or, uh, but, you know, there's a kind of different outcome from each of these, these strategies because if the disk fails, then, you know, it takes some time to replace and then you're open to A, losing block rewards and B, uh, getting your collateral slashed. Um, so it's kind of like under uh, under these kind of different trade-offs. Like if you buy the buy a new disc too early, then you've got to pay more. If you wait too long, of course you've got to pay less for discs, but you've got more chance of having an unplanned failure and getting slashed. So so under this kind of situation, what's the optimal strategy? So one way. Uh, so. Part of what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm not going to give you a price that is $10 for uh, storing something forever, but I'm going to set out some of the methodologies to think about this. So one way you can appro approach this, this kind of optimal strategy problem is to treat it as a renewal reward process. So as time goes on, disks can fail uh, after a random amount of time, and they can fail it with different... Uh, they can stop working uh, via different modes, so they can fail or they can be retired. Uh, and whenever this happens, uh, there's different ways that you can uh, realize costs. It can be through having to buy a new disk or slashing or block rewards. So to make progress in this, we can use the renewal reward theorem, which is given here. Um, and okay, so yeah, we can use this renewal reward theorem, which states uh, that the expectation of this process is given in terms of the expectation of the costs uh, divided by the expectation of the disk lifetime. So good, but expectation over what? Expectation over some distribution. So we can model this distribution as the kind of classic uh, failure uh, distribution um, from reliability modeling, which is this kind of bathtub shift curve, as you see here. Now to actually model it, we can model it as a stretched out beta distribution. Okay, fine, we can do that. Uh, so now our optimization problem is we want to optimize this functional. How can we do this? Um, so we can't do it straight away because we don't know what the expected cost is and we don't know what the expected lifetime is. But if we break it up into the different modes of in which the, the expected lifetime can be realized, uh, then, we, then we can work these things out. So if we, if we kind of expand that expect, ex, expected cost into the different thing, different ways that it can occur, and we expand the expected lifetime into the different ways that 
that can occur as well. Then we've got something that we can easily evaluate. And if we do this, we can find this optimization problem, plug in some numbers, okay, warranties, two years, three years, whatever, and, and find an optimal replacement policy for that disk. So this kind of feeds into uh, knowing how long you should keep your disks for uh, informing uh, miners, and of course it can feed into cost models. So Another approach we can take to think about factors that affect price uh, over a long period of time, again, is hardware. And so for hardware, um, physical media, we have, we have price information. So we have this kind of Moore's Law-esque um, uh, time series data. I mean, as you can see here, over the past 20 years on this log, um, log scale, it's, it's effectively linear. Now, will this continue? I don't know. But... Uh, you, you have to assume something. You always have to have assumptions in models. And if we, if we have this assumption, can we somehow use it to inform what the price of the Filecoin deals might be in the future? So Filecoin deals, I mean, they've only been around for about a year. Um, so it's kind of difficult to imagine how they might go in the future. But of course, hardware is an underlying factor. So can we use this historical data to inform uh, what the price might look like in the, in the future? And yeah, sure you can. Uh, so we can make it like a simple uh, generalized linear model. And if we do this and we have some partial pooling of the coefficients in the model, so we can say, OK, we're going to let the slopes of the historical data for, for disk drives inform what the deal prices might look like, then we can we can come up with some kind of trend for the future. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so we can we can do this, um, and of course um, we can we get a distribution uh, if if we in integrate these these forecasts in the future over all of the different realizations from the MC MC inference, then we can work out a distribution for costs. Uh, of storage in the future. But of course, this is kind of limited because this is not the only factor that affects deal prices. There's there's so many other things. You've got to think about electricity, you've got to think about bandwidth, um, as, well, as well as just a market perception of what the demand might be. Okay, so that's one factor. Uh, mostly what I'm doing here is kind of setting out some tools and frameworks for ways that we might think about this. So slight change of direction. Another uh, factor is uh, trying to consider how we might uh, fund this. So one way to fund it is in terms of a yield-bearing token or some kind of bond. So how, how does this work? This works, uh, so in, instead of paying for the, the price of the storage fully upfront, is there some way that we can distribute the, the payments into the future using the interest uh, from, from from a bond, for example. So it's going to be something that's very stable, that produces a, a, a yield every year, and that can continuously be drawn from. So if we, if we invest in a bond, we expect to get something something like this, uh, where where the, the value of that grows over time, uh, as stated here. Now, this, this kind of growth sort of satisfies this simple differential equation, but what if we don't just let the, the bond grow and instead we deplete it over time by using it, the interest to pay uh, storage providers? So instead we get this kind of little differential equation like at the bottom. So now the kind of question becomes, okay, so if the cl client who wants to store data buys this bond and uses the interest on it to, to pay the storage provider, uh, what does this look like? So how much do you need to put up for the initial bond in order to, to, to pay for the storage? So this effectively comes down to saying something like, okay, can you solve this equation under conditions, for example, like what I want is the bond to pay for the storage and for this to be completely depleted over the lifetime of the storage, for example, 100 years. So we can solve this, we can solve it, but only if we make a lot of assumptions. So we still need some kind of model for what the storage is going to look like in the, in the future, for what the, the deal prices are going to be. But if we assume that the, the storage price goes down very slowly, then we're kind of got this scenario, 
yeah, so if we if we do make assumptions that it goes down very slowly, then we're in this kind of regime where okay, you've got, you've got to pay a lot if you're if you have low interest rates, or if you've got a very high interest rate, you can pay less, and you can work out what these curves are and where where you sit on it. But fundamentally, we we have a, a kind of tricky problem in that a we we don't exactly know what the the risk free rate of return should be, and b we don't precisely know what the fundamental costs that feed into determining the price of storage in the future are going to be so these are all things that are assumed but sure we can we can come up with a with a model that changes the funding and how how the cost is distributed over time but there's there's more to it than that i guess that's what i'm saying um yeah so i think those are the kind of key points that i wanted to make today uh if you want to think about very long-term storage, for sure, we should absolutely do this. It's completely critical and very important. And there's a lot of fundamental things we have to think about in terms of hardware prices and bandwidth and electricity that go into determining this. And we can make a lot of progress on this, and we can make a lot of progress on the funding side as well. Um, but I think there's still some way to go. But, yeah, we're going in the right direction. So I'll finish it with that. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that time, for that nice reflection on the difficulties and the complexities inherent in modeling this sort of perpetual storage, these sorts of long-term questions. Speaking of long-term questions, do we have any questions to the speaker? Yeah. I just want to be here. Thanks so much. That was super, super interesting. Um, I'm curious, I mean, I, I think some of these things where you're like, oh, there's a ton of assumptions to consider and, and it's just mm -hmm. like very hard to do. I think insurances do it, right? Like all the time, they like model very uncertain events and then there's still some price that they set to determine that, you know, this is what I'm willing to accept as a price and then sometimes they make wrong bets. I, I'm, I'm curious, and then our weave exists, right? And they have, I think, articulated some price where they're like, you pay for the first 200 years with 30% of whatever you put down and then the rest goes into an endowment that I guess is similar to what you're describing that mm. then yields some interest and assumes some price decline for other things. Mm -hmm. What's your take on um, how they're approaching the pricing? I, I know it's like a, a different model in that there's like only probabilistic guarantees for storage still being around versus in far grand is more deterministic, but just curious, um, like... Right, like our weave has, has kind of tried to address that and has come up with some kind of mechanism to price it. So curious, what do you take us there? Uh, yeah. So it's kind of an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think there's two ways to think about this in general. I think there's a the research aspect and looking into all of these details. And you can go into definitely a lot more detail than is in the our weave paper, which is kind of a relatively simple model and makes quite hardcore assumptions. And trying to look into some of the sort of sub problems and sub details is what I'm doing here. And that's kind of more of a research question. And then there's kind of a more of a business side, which is like, OK, we've got this idea. We're going to release it. There is going to be some risk associated with it. It might work. It might not. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like two sides. I, I, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but that's kind of what I feel. Um, you know, you, you can jump into doing it, uh, but it, it's 100% not going to be guaranteed. There is going to be a little bit of risk associated with it. Um, yeah. Right. So I think, you know, a lot of this we're thinking having a proof of storage every day, right? But if some of these older data, they really probably don't require that necessarily. So, you know, what what are the requirements if you want to really put it in a glacier type storage environment, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, so I mean, that, I guess that's kind of an interesting question that maybe touches on some of the kind of deeper protocol level aspects that we might want to think about in the future. So, that, you know, currently we have proofs of storage that go every 24 hours, maybe for very long uh, term storage. That's That's not even something we necessarily have to have. You could have... Uh, proofs that are only submitted once a week or something like that, um, which which might uh, change the cost as well. So, I mean, I think that kind of touches on quite an interesting idea for sure. Well, thanks again, Tom, for a great talk and for giving us, again, that long-term perspective. Yeah.